It's good to be alive at a live Wesleyan church, is it not? This morning, as I call to worship, I'd like to read uh, a couple of verses, three verses, from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 3. It really is a beautiful, universal invitation to us, and it describes what happens when God's people, such as ourselves, come together to worship him. Verse 1 begins, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And so are you thirsty for God and his good news this morning? That's good, because your thirst will be quenched as you are here, open up, opened to uh, our Lord and Savior. And then there's a bit of oddity as the invitation continues. It says this, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And what's odd about that is that Isaiah acknowledges the fact that we are a needy people with no money, but then he uses the word buy. He says, come, buy, and eat. Well, we're here today to receive all the benefits and blessings that God has for us because someone else paid the price. We are here to buy or receive because someone else is laying down the money for us, so to speak. And we're talking about, of course, the shed blood of our Lord and Savior. Colossians 1.14 puts it this way, His dear Son purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And then Isaiah 55, 2-3 goes on to say, Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for paying the price so we can come empty-handed and needy to receive all your wonderful gifts, especially the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who gives us truth and life. Lord, we are here to eat what is good and to delight in your abundance. We want to sing our thanks and offer our praises with all our hearts. And then we want to incline our ears to hear your word as Pastor Eric presents it to us this morning. As we hear you throughout this hour, we re please renew us and put your life into our souls. Amen. Good morning, and we do welcome you to Alive Wesleyan Church and our online congregation. We just ask that you continue to be blessed and be safe. And those that are able, please stand, and we're going to worship our Lord. Glory to the name of 
Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen? We want to let you know of a few things that are going on. And one, I just want to take a, a second this morning. Uh, for the last several weeks, we've been streaming our lives, our services live on Facebook. And I just want to take a moment to thank Steve and Josh up there, uh, who have faithfully been videotaping it and putting it on live. So thank you, Josh and Steve, for all your hard work. Let's give them a round of applause. We also want to let you know of a few things. One is the daily bread is available. It arrived this past week, so we have daily bread if you want, uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, we're continuing not to take offering during the Sunday morning services, but there's plates up here and boxes in the back and front, so you can throw your offering in that, or you can continue to give online. Don't forget about youth group, uh, youth group tonight at 5.30, prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and something to put on your can calendar. Our annual meeting is coming up August 16th at 5.30. That's a Sunday evening. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the budget, uh, exciting things like that. But we'll also be talking about, you know, where we're headed as a church, where we've been the last four months as we've gone through the shutdown. Uh, so it gives you an opportunity to come and, and kind of hear what's been going on and kind of where we're headed. Uh, so we want to invite everyone out uh, August 16th at 530. All right, let's bow our heads with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we do once again thank you that we can be in your house this morning. Lord, we believe this is your day, a day that you have made for us to be here, to speak to us. Father, we ask your blessing over the service that you will, even now, just prepare our hearts to hear from you. Father, our great desire this morning, above all else, is just to meet with you, to hear you to speak to our hearts. So, Father, attune our hearts to your voice. Help us to prepare ourselves. Help us to be ready, whether we, we hear from you as we sing these songs and the, the lyrics that we sing whether as we have our heads bowed and we're in prayer to hear your still, small voice, or, Father, as we open up your word and we read it, may you just have an impact on our hearts this morning, that we may be here this morning and be changed because we've met with the living God. Pray for your blessing over this service this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Well, this time we have a, a special slideshow that Rachel put together uh, for our church family. So if you guys want to show that. Wandering in sin I went searching for redemption Down a road that had no end I was walking through the fire I was living on the run With my flesh lost in desire I was drowning in the flood But God
counting how many pictures there are of Rachel in that slideshow. It seems to be. But we do want to, uh, we want to put that together because, you know, we are a church family. And I hope you know that. And we've certainly been through a lot over the last four months. Uh, and it's great to see so many of you back and to be together as a church family, to pray together, uh, a privilege to be your pastor through this. And I hope you know that you guys are loved and uh, hopefully as we come back together, we'll be stronger than ever. So uh, just a, a word of encouragement to each of you. Do you want to go to the Lord in, in prayer together with our praises and testimonies? Uh, many of you um, hopefully got the email yesterday of uh, an emergency in the White family. Uh, Barry called last night and had a prayer request that his son and grandson were missing after a kayak trip. And it takes a little while to put those emails out as we in our system. And I think within about 15 minutes, half an hour of sending that prayer request out, we got a call back to say they had been found safe and sound. So that's a great prayer, and it's amazing to see God answer prayer that quickly. Uh, are there other prayer requests or praises we can lift up this morning? Eva. morning. Greg hit the keys. <laughs> Anybody else this morning with a prayer request? Debbie? This young man, I think he's 15, 14 or 15, uh, Sean, who had a diving accident a week and a half ago, dove into shallow water and fractures in his neck and spine. But the surgery went well last Sunday, so let's just lift him up for that recovery. Anybody else this morning? Sure.
that up in prayer. College students going back to school, decisions this week being made for our uh, students in general around this area as well. A lot to lift up. Anybody else this morning? <laughs> All right, praise Gordy with his new job, uh, store manager up in Watertown, Hobby Lobby. Anybody else? Let's go, Lord, in prayer together. Lift one another up. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning. We thank you that we serve such a, a wonderful and loving God. We thank you that we serve a, a sovereign God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And Lord, as we go to prayer this morning, we are again reminded of the words of the Psalms that ask, where does my help come from? And Lord, with each of these requests, each of these burdens on our hearts, Lord, let us again be reminded that our help comes from you. That there is nothing too great for you. There is nothing that overwhelms you. There is nothing that even comes as a surprise to you. Father, help us to lean into you, to trust you, to have faith in you. Lord, this morning as we will in a minute lift up requests and burdens on our hearts, we, we begin by just reflecting on the testimonies we can have of answered prayer. Father, I am amazed last night that within the span of what couldn't have been more than 20 minutes, prayer requests went up for, for the White family desperate prayer request for a, a, a young man and his very young son missing. And Lord, that within those 20 minutes that you answered those prayer requests abundantly. We thank you that, that Chad and Oliver were found safe and sound. That they were able to get back and be home and be safe, Lord. And we just thank you for, for hearing the prayer requests that were lifted up. For the, the peace and the assurance that you gave Barry and Cheryl and the, the family there, Lord. We just thank you for, for hearing and being at work. Father, we think of that huge request uh, of, of this young family being missing to, to Eva's request of missing keys, Lord, that you are a God that cares so much about each aspect of our lives from those things that maybe we consider huge to the things that maybe the world would consider small. But Lord, you're a, a God that is intimately involved in our lives. We thank you for hearing prayers and answering them. Father, that there is nothing too small that we can't lift up to you, that we have that relationship with you. Father, we thank you for answering the, the prayer request 
uh, that Sharon brought up this morning, this, this elderly woman and the difficulty of transition and having to move, Lord. And what maybe at first seemed like a, a difficult transition and a, a woman that maybe seemed unthankful at the time, but now, Lord, has, uh, has seen and come back and been thankful, Lord. So, Father, we answer, thank you for answering those prayer requests. Father, we thank you for being with Gordy this past, uh, past month, Lord, and this new job for him, a promotion to a store manager in Watertown. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for this new opportunity for him and a, a new chapter for Gordy and his family. Father, we, we lift him up for this transition and, Lord, this new uh, having to drive back and forth to Watertown, that you watch over him and give him safety. Bless him in this new position. Be with him as he, he gets used to that, as he interacts with new employees. We just ask for your blessing over him, Lord. Father, this morning we lift up the needs that are before us. Uh, Father, we want to lift up Sean to you. Uh, Father, we pray for him after this diving accident. We thank you for that the surgery has gone well for him. And we just pray for this young man that he will recover fully, Lord. Help him during this time to take things slow and not to re-injure himself. We just pray that you'll be with Sean to encourage him, to bring a quick healing over him. Just pray that you'll be with this young man, that he'll feel your presence with him. Father, we... We lift up elderly that we know that are connected to this church. And fire those that are maybe stuck at home, those that are going through a difficult time, a, a sense of isolation. We pray you'd be with them. Come alongside of them and minister to them, Lord. We pray for your encouragement to be there with them, Lord. And Father, we, we lift up Caleb's prayer request to you this morning. Father, as we think of uh, the college students and all they've had to go through over the last many months, Lord, that you will be with them. Father, we have focused a lot on, on the impact of a virus and what it's done. But Lord, we're seeing more and more the impact that it's having on people's mental health and the, the struggles of being isolated, the struggles of being knocked out of their normal routines from the youngest of us to the oldest of us, Father. So Father, we want to lift up the college students as they, they deal with this, as they face the pers prospects of maybe going back to online school or going back to actual classrooms, Father, I pray that you will guide them and direct them. We pray for their mental health and, Lord, that they would just have relationships, that they'd have people around them that would encourage them. Lord, that they would lean into you and sense your presence in their lives. And Lord, that you would just encourage them. We pray for the tough decisions that need to be made with finances, Lord. Father, we know in this country that going to college is not not cheap, Lord. So, Father, I pray that you help them through this to make good decisions. Lord, we lift up Caleb and the decisions that he'll have to make and pray that you'd be with him and encourage him through that, give him just an enormous sense of wisdom and direction, Lord. Father, this morning we thank you for who you are, that you are a righteous God. And Father, as we said earlier, that some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we will trust in your name. Father, as Eve has brought forward, Lord, help us to make the decision to side with you, O oh Lord, to know which side you're on. Father, to make our decision to faithfully follow you, even through the chaos of the world, Lord, that you are a good and loving God. Father, this morning, as we continue in worship, we pray that you will inhabit the, the praises of our lips, Lord, that you'll give us understanding as we open up your word. Father, we thank you for this time of prayer, and we lift all this up in your wonderful name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come back up, continue in worship. Those of you that are able, please stand and continue worship. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Yes, 
Bibles in front of you or one you brought from home. Let's turn to the book of Romans this morning. Let's see if I can preach this message this morning without getting in trouble. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. As we look at us and the state together. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. hear God's word. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. The Apostle Paul writes, Let every soul be subject to the government, to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So that God will help us through that passage this morning as we look at it. Well, you talk about getting more and more difficult as we go from week to week. You know, this week is going to be a doozy for some of you. Right, last week, God told us to love our enemies. If our enemy was hungry, to feed them. If our enemy was thirsty, to, to give them something to drink. And, and it was challenging, right? And I know it's uh, generated some conversation in some families around the dinner table, which is a, a good thing. Sometimes it's the things that make us uncomfortable are the things that force us to grow. Right? And God can use those things to change us. Well, today's entire sermon and these verses may make us uncomfortable. There may be some more uncomfortable conversations. I probably could not have scheduled this message for a, a better time or a worse time, depending on how you want to look at it, if we had tried to plan it, us and the state. Right? And this is the, the fourth message in this series, which began by us looking at us and God, and then we looked at us and each other, other believers inside the church, and then last week we looked at us and, and them, those outside the church. Well, this week we continue this progression. And, and a few things. One is I, I want to keep reminding you that this is not meant to be some kind of academic exercise. Right? Paul writes these things in Romans 12 and, and Romans 13 and beyond because he really wants us to live them out. Right? God expects us, if we really desire to be a true follower of Christ, to live these things out, right? There's no longer about words. No longer just a theology lesson. This is where the rubber meets the road. Are we living like a disciple of Christ? Not just talking like one. And secondly, I want to reinforce that each progression builds off of the previous instruction, right? You probably never just come to one of these and say, okay, you know, I, I got it. I, I can check it off the list. That one's all accomplished, and I, I don't ever have to worry about that one. Right? We probably have to keep going back. Right? Our relationship with God, the very first one, it is always something to focus on, and it, it helps us to navigate through the rest. Right? If you struggle with this one, go back to the very first one, us and God, and that, that helps us with us and each other. It helps us with us and, and outside unbelievers. It helps us with us and the state. You know, I kind of picture it this way. Imagine that you're trying to get up on the roof, and you have this huge ladder in front of you. 
right? There's this tall ladder in front of you. How hard would it be if you just kind of skipped the first four rungs and just start with rung number five, right? It'd be kind of hard to get up there. And so Paul presents it this way to look at it like a ladder. First, I, I step on rung one, then I go up to rung two, I go up to rung three, four, and five, and it helps me get all the way to the top. And that's how Paul is going through these relationships and the practical application in Romans, right? If you, if you just came in this morning or you did your devotions and you just open up your Bible, Romans 13, and it talks about us in the state, well, that may be difficult, right? If you think about last week and if you just kind of walk in fresh and I say, well, I want you to love your enemies, right? That's a, a tough assignment. But if we continually build on a, a solid foundation, right? If we, if we keep going back to us and God, that I'm offering my body as a, a living sacrifice, I'm, I'm transformed by the renew, renewing of my mind, by the power of God's Spirit at work in me, then it becomes doable. When I begin to understand that everything follows, my, my love for other people in the church, my love even for my enemies, my ability to to be subject to authority is all founded in God's will for his children. Right? His good and acceptable and perfect will. Then I'm, I'm enabled to live this out, even as it is challenging. And today's message is challenging, right? If you think about our environment. Our passage begins with these words. Look at verse 1 again. Let every soul be subject to governing authority. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. You know, one of the, the challenges when I, I decided I was just going to preach through Romans here is that you can't just skip things, right? You've got to touch even on the hard ones. Well, Paul begins in Romans 13 by talking about how we as Christians, you know, ought to become under the authority of the government, right? The, the government has authority over us. Like, yikes, right? That's... For some, that's challenging, and for some, it probably feels like it comes out of nowhere, right? Let's, let, let's talk about God's mercy, let's talk about God's, God's love, let's talk about forgiveness, but, but who wants to come to church and, and hear a sermon about listening to the government? I'll tell you, for the modern Christian, this, this section of Scripture seems to jar us, right? Like, it, it doesn't fit within the confines of the church. William Barclay remarked that this is an extremely surprising passage to counsel absolute obedience to the civil power. Right? We, we come to church and we hear a sermon, okay, well, uh, he, in week one he talked about God. Well, all right, I kind of expect that, right? Uh, and then he talked about loving each other inside the church. Well, that's a, that's a, that makes sense. I, I can listen to that sermon. Then he talked about loving people outside the church. Well, that, that's part of the Bible, so, so I can get on board with that. All that's what we expect is, as valid subjects for a sermon. But the government, what about separation of church and state, Pastor? You, you better not talk about this. We'll lose our tax-exempt status. You know, as many feel that this isn't a, a proper church topic. And it's, it's interesting that we can have that mindset. Right? Maybe some of you feel that way. I won't ask for a show of hands. But we also need to understand that this is a more recent thought, right? Especially in the American church. For years, from the beginning, the church and our faith has been connected and intertwined in this country. But then in more recent decades, suddenly the movement was church stays inside the building, right? Our faith is something private. Separation of church and state. Christians withdrew, this is the state, and that's the church, and the two shall have no impact on each other. Right? Certainly that was part of a, a movement to kind of departmentalize our faith the Sunday morning, right? As Christians, you could go to church on Sundays, but you better not bring your faith back to the workplace. You, you better not bring your faith back to the, to the school. You better not bring your faith back to the, the voting booth, and many churches bought into that separation even as far as encouraging Christians not to vote. I've heard pastors tell people you shouldn't vote. If you're a Christian, you better not vote. Right? That, that's, a, that's a worldly pursuit. That's something the world does, but our faith is inside the church. And the American church has been great at this. 
with that in our minds, we, we come to this passage, and, and maybe it'll take a few moments, but it feels maybe unnatural at the very beginning, right? You, you open up Romans 13, he's been talking about love and doing good and all these things, and all of a sudden he says, let every soul be subject to the governing authority. It kind of seems like it, it comes out of left field, doesn't it? And I would say that maybe first and foremost, it should awaken the church to realize that we aren't to live in a hole. Right? We, we aren't to hide inside the church. Right? The, the First Amendment gives us the right to worship. A government can't prohibit that. There's, there is separation of church and state so that the state cannot mandate a certain religion. But it certainly doesn't limit us as Christians to be involved with the government. Right? In a few months, there will be a, a presidential election. As Christians, we should be involved, not just for president, but with all levels of government, right? Christians should be informed and involved. We should be voicing our beliefs and, and more importantly, voting our beliefs, right? What are the issues? Like, like sanctity of life that are impacted by Scripture that should be governing believers, right? Those are something to be praying about. And I'll be honest, it isn't about going into the voting booth and, and pulling out my political party registration card to know how I should vote. It should be asking God, looking at Scripture, who should I be voting for? What is important? And here Paul calls us and he says, be under the authority of the government. And he states that the government received authority from God. All right, look at your Bibles at the next two verses. Verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not tear to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. In verse 2, Paul pulls out the therefore card. You know, here's God's command. He says, here is God's system. It isn't about arguing. He says, what is our response going to be? And I think part of it uh, is you have to read it in context, right? It goes back to last week. Last week, he said this in verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will pay, says the Lord, right? Last week, he, he talked about how it wasn't our job to get revenge. It was part of God, right? And, and part of God's tool for vengeance or God's tool for justice is the state. Right? He says that clearly in verse 4. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now there's a, a lot in these verses. Right? In the Bible, God establishes three institutions. The first institution he, he creates is what? The family. Right? Genesis chapter 2. Then he institutes the government, Genesis chapter 9. And finally, he institutes the church, Acts chapter 2. Now, in all three of these institutions, we can see sometimes that there can be a struggle with authority, right? Sin impacts all three. Here, God speaks about us coming under the authority of the state, and he says, the state is a minister under God's authority. Right? Sometimes we have a hard time coming under people's authority, don't we? Certainly part of what he's saying is that God uses them to accomplish wrath or justice, like we talked about last week. Now, the first thing to see is that that is not saying that as instruments of God's wrath, they themselves are holy, right? The, the same idea is in the Old Testament, right? God says, my instrument of justice, my instrument of wrath, he, he talked about the Assyrians, right? An ungodly pagan nation. He talks about the Babylonians. He, he talks about the Medes and the Persians. So we're not saying that the government is righteous. But it is saying that we're called in general to come underneath their authority. Titus 3.1, he writes to the church, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey and to be ready for every good work. And, and you look at verse 3 with me, towards the middle, it says this, Do what is good. And, and I find it interesting that in every single level that Paul has gone through, all these relationships... He always comes back to doing good, right? When he, in, 
In, in verse 2, when he talks about our relationship with God, he says, know what is the good and perfect will of God and do that. In, in verse 9, inside the church, he says, cling to what is good. Last week in verse 17, looking at our enemies, he says, do what is good. See, this, that's what this section is about. And, and this is what we can struggle with, right? If you start to hear this sermon and, and your, your heart gets a little tense... And you start thinking about, well, I don't like the government. Or I have a hard time with the government. Take solace because Paul is not writing to the government. He's writing to us. Right? This section has nothing to do with the government as far as their responsibility. It has to do with us. Right? Paul did not write Romans 13, 1 through 7 and stick it in an envelope and mail it to Rome or to Caesar. He handed it to the church. And so, again, as we look at unbelievers, as we look at inside the church, as we look at the state, it has nothing to do with them. It has to do with us and our responsibility. The responsibility from God is upon us. And I find it amazing that I was writing this sermon, considering all that we, we've seen on the news for months and months and months. It's, it's interesting, Warren Warsby he comments on this verse in his commentary on Romans 13, and he wrote this in 2007, and he said this, we cannot riot in the name of Christ. We as Christians cannot riot in the name of Christ, that that is never what God is calling us to do. That isn't our weapon against the government. Well, you say, well, then, then what is it? What, what am I supposed to do? Well, Paul addresses that. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior. Right? Paul says we're not only supposed to be subject to the government, he says you are supposed to be praying for the government. You know, I sometimes wonder if Christians spent more time praying for the politicians they dislike than cursing and complaining about them if we wouldn't see wonderful things happen. Well, maybe you're saying, well, I'm sure as Paul writes these verses, he's only talking about a good government. Right? He's only talking about good kings. Paul would never ask that if he knew what we have to deal with in 2020. Right? And you could pick your side of the political aisle, right? Surely he would never expect me to pray and respect President Trump. Or, or if Paul understood, he, he didn't mean for me to respect and pray for Governor Cuomo. You guys could say his name in church and the ceiling didn't fall down. Just joking, don't get offended. But here's something so eye-opening to me that I want you to think about. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to the church in Rome. Well, guess what? That was not the ideal Christian embracing government at that time. Paul writes the book of Romans in about 56 A.D. Who was the Roman Caesar in 56 A.D.? Who was the government Paul is telling the Christian to be in subject to that are God's ministers? Well, in 56 A.D., the, the Caesar of Rome was Nero. Anybody heard of him? Right? Nero was the, the Caesar of Rome. He was in charge of it. He was initially labeled as merely incompetent, but later turned evil and sadistic. He, he killed his own mother for unknown reasons. He then began a, a rampant abuse of just executing his, any rivals without restraint. He kills his own stepbrother. He ends up exiling his wife because she can't bear him a child and then just executes her to get her out of the way. One biographer wrote, Nero lost all sense of right and wrong and listened to flattery. Well, then you look at what else Paul wrote. He wrote that letter to Timothy in 64 AD, that, that instruction that we ought to pray for the king and all those in authority over us. Well, what happened in 64 AD? 64 AD, Nero set fire to the city of Rome and then he blamed it on the Christians, said the Christians set this thing on fire. And that began one of the worst severe persecutions of Christians ever. 
right? Christians were being massacred and tortured left and right. It was so bad that the, the Christians of Paul's day said that Nero certainly must be the Antichrist the Bible is talking about. Several years later, about 68 A.D., Nero would execute both Paul and Peter in the same year to attempt to eradicate Christianity. Don't tell me that you can't bring yourself to pray for some specific politician. Right? Paul told the churches to pray for Nero, who was going to execute him by beheading him. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 2, he says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to kings as supreme or to governors, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He says, As bondservants, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Again, this is... As we read this, this is, this is real life. This is real application, right? It will cost you something, right? Some of you very sincerely believe it will cost you a little part, bit of your heart to pray for certain politicians. But are we going to be obedient? I always remember George Radham. I miss George. And George, if you knew George, George was... George was was all about this intersection of faith and, and politics, right? He was, he was fervent in, in that we should be involved in politics. George always had a, a brochure in his back pocket or his front sleeve to tell you about who you should vote for and what the issues were. He would set up tables out here to register you to vote, and he was always about telling you which politicians stood on all these different issues, right? That was part of George, probably more fervent at that than anybody I've ever known. But amid that solid foundation and a solid conviction which politicians were right and that you should support and which were not his favorite, George often shared with me his fervent prayer for those politicians, especially the ones he didn't think were right. And George would go as far as to, to mail letters of prayer to those politicians that he didn't agree with. He'd write letters of, of prayer and send them to them. Right? That was living it out, and it always impressed me. Tertullian was born in 155 A.D. He was an influential church father, and he wrote this sermon once. He wrote that our responsibility is to be faithful in prayer for those in authority. He said the church needed to view the Caesars of Rome as more as a part of the church than they were a part of the world because he said God had put them in authority and God had entrusted them to the church. So he said, regardless of how corrupt they were, regardless of how pagan they were, we as the church needed to embrace them in prayer because God had put them there. Paul writes in Romans 13, 5, that we have two reasons to abide the government. Because of wrath, right, to avoid punishment. And he says the second is for conscience sake. This idea that as we obey the state, we have a clear conscience before God. And then Paul ends the section, and he wanted to talk about taxes. Anybody enjoy talking about taxes? Is that why you came to church this morning? Well, look at the last two verses. For because of this, you also must pay taxes. Right? It's right there in the Bible. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Then look at verse 7. Right? In verse 7, sometimes we could just read over it in a second, skip it, throw away verse. But it says, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Well, anybody read verses 6 and 7 for their devotional this morning? Anybody ever read those verses for your devotional? Right? We usually don't, it's probably not our favorite verses to talk about taxes. But anybody remember any other instance in the Bible when they talk about taxes in the New Testament? What was it? All right, Jesus has this discussion. The, the political leaders come and they say, you know, do we have to pay taxes? And Jesus says, well, show me a coin. Somebody pulls out a coin. He says, well, whose face is on that coin? They say, Caesar. And then Jesus says, 
famous thing, Matthew 22, verse 21, he says, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. And if you look here, Paul kind of uses similar words here, right? He even starts with the idea of render, therefore, to all their due. At the end he says, to fear, to whom fear, honor, to whom honor. See, as we come to the end of this section, it, it is important for the church to understand that it isn't blind allegiance to the government he's asking for. We have to be able to delineate what is Caesar's and what is God's. Right? And the truth is that the Jews of, uh, of Jesus' day struggled with that. The, the Jews of Jesus' day were notoriously rebellious against Rome. Right? They were always plotting rebellions. They were always revolting against Rome. And the, the Christians of Paul's day also struggled with this. Right? Think about Jesus, his 12 disciples. During that time, they had the zealots. Right? They, were, they were revolutionaries. Jesus even had Simon the zealot as one of his 12 disciples. Right? The, the zealots believed in a military overthrow of the oppressive Roman government. Right? We're going to violently rise up against them. We're going to throw them off. We'll be liberated from the Roman Empire. Even after the resurrection, what do the disciples ask Jesus? Acts 1.6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? In Paul's day, the question was asked, as Christians, will we be under the authority of the state? Wait, should we riot in his name because God is higher than the state? Well, I think this passage speaks powerfully to our time, right? Be in the subjection to the government, no matter who is in office. God's call is not to riot in the name of Jesus. There's no call to violence to find justice or peace. But with that said, what about if the state goes against the church? Well, then it goes back to what Jesus said. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things of God that are God's, right? Jesus says we have to be able to know the difference. We're called to be subject under the state unless it violates God's other institutions, the family and the church. Sometimes that's the struggle we have, isn't it? Right? That's what we're dealing with in our country right now. How much can the state infringe on our right to worship? Right? One thing John MacArthur wrote this past week about this, he says, in short, as the church, we do not need the state's permission to serve and worship the Lord as he has commanded. Right? And the, the Bible gives us examples of that. Romans 5, or Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. They say, well, we're, we're called to be in subjection, but that's where it gets messy. When you say, well, it's just black and white to me, we have to remember every time we send a missionary to China, we're violating a law. Right now, there are Christian pastors in Iran that are in prison because they're preaching the gospel for violating a law. Even in our own country, there are churches that are being fined and, and closed simply for trying to gather together for worship. See, there's a, a tension here that Paul and Jesus give us that we need resilience on the wisdom of the Lord. Right now in our country, we need that wisdom and prayer, both for those that think they are rioting in the name of Jesus to create something against the state, and for the church to seek God's authority over man's permission and approval. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning. Father, fully acknowledging that these passages may seem foreign to us and difficult for us. And so, Father, we come in humility, asking for your wisdom and direction. Father, when we think about what Paul is writing to, to a church in Rome that was suffering under an abusive dictator in Nero, Father, it should shame us if we aren't willing to pray for our president, if we aren't willing to pray for our governor, and those in authority over us. Father, help us to have a heart that lifts these men and women up that are in our government, that you will guide them in righteousness and peace and direction. Father, help us not to be Christians who are just grumbling, complaining, and cursing those in authority over us, but to sincerely lift them up in prayer. 
Father, we pray that you will change hearts where hearts need to be changed, that you'll give them wisdom where they need wisdom. Father, we pray for our country, that you will just guide it, guide it back to you, bring revival to it. But Father, as we sit in the church and we pray for revival, help us to recognize that revival begins with each of us. That morality will never be dictated by some law. Morality will not begin with some president or some governor. It begins with the church and the people in the church. Father, we think of the words of Second Chronicles, that if the people who are called by your name will humble themselves, lift up their prayers to you, Father, that you will hear and do a mighty work. So, Father, as the church, as people of God, we do humble ourselves this morning. We pray for forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, that you will bring revival. And may it begin with me. May it begin with each of us, Father. Lord, we pray that you will help us to take this passage into our hearts. Live it out, even if it is challenging. Give us wisdom and direction. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. I ask you to stand as we close in worship.
benediction today is a benediction of sanctification. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, body, and soul be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in his name. Amen.